if I am with you. Praise the Lord. Um, today I'm going to uh, share a bit different type of message because I will start from a testimony and then uh, through this testimony uh, we'll draw some lessons and life applications as we enter into this uh, time of prayer and fasting. Many of you know uh, bits and pieces of this testimony, what happened to me on December 12th uh, last month. And uh, we were here uh, in Lighthouse that hosting the pastor's prayer. And we were many people in this room here. We had about 50 people. And I gave the welcome, and I gave the, the devotion to them. And then after that, I started to feel weak and on, you know, discomfort and everything. And it was very fast. It was very, very fast. Then I ended up in the hospital <laughs> without any warning signs. Uh, it just, just like that. I've never been sick in my life. I've been always thinking I was very uh, healthy. Suddenly, without warning, I was having an acute heart attack. And I am very thankful to God that he orchestrated this uh, situation, the circumstances, then, and the way that I was at the right place at the right time. I was here in Lighthouse near the hospital and I was taken to the right place. So the part one of my testimony I want to share with you this morning is I want to talk about the pain um, and how sudden uh, you and I, in that case me, in any case it could be you, we can be facing uh, death. For those of you who have heard in your lifetime or have uh, been thinking, oh, uh, it's okay, I still have time. I can, uh, on my deathbed, I can settle with God. Okay, I want to tell you, by my experience, it's not going to work. There's good chance it's not going to work in this way. And I will explain to you why. Because, um, and also I know a friend of uh, Brigitte and I, when we were younger, when we both received the Lord that day, we were three people together sitting, sitting <coughs> together. Brigitte, myself, we were uh, not saved yet. We, we still had our, our long hair and we were still in drugs and things like this. And then we had a friend uh, with us, Mark was with us. Both of us, we were seized by the Holy Spirit and convinced uh, that we were sinners and we got converted that night. But Mark, our friend, says, no, I'm not ready, I'm skeptic, I still have time, I'm too young. Later on, on my deathbed, I have time to settle with God, but for now, I want to enjoy my life. Later on, he went from depression to depression, electric shocks, uh, hospital, uh, mental hospital, and all this, to take his own life uh, after that. When you die, according to what I have experienced, either death will be too sudden. Like my brother died like this. He was driving in the middle of the night, missed the curve, got into a tree, the car burned, and he died on the spot. Uh, probably from the accident, not from being, his body was completely burned. This, these things happen suddenly to anybody at any age of whatever, teenagers, it happens to teenagers, it happens to anybody. Either death comes too sudden, or the pain is too intense. Like in my case, when I was here that morning, you can ask to people who saw me leaving this room and uh, leaving the, the building, I had an acute pain on both sides here that was unbearable, and that was all I could think of. I could not think, oh, Holy Spirit, God, uh, heaven, uh, you know, I'm coming to you, Lord. No, there was, there was no ability uh, in this, this human faculty to think about uh, about this, about, about the, the, the step of, of dying because the pain overwhelm all of the, your ability and that's all that matters, that's all that you are concerned with and that's all you think uh, of at the time. All your brain does is being overpowered by the pain. So application number one this morning is uh, be ready to meet your, your maker. Don't delay repenting. Don't uh, stop or put off dealing with your sin, with anything that hinders you, anything that distracts your spiritual life, anything that takes what is the most important in your life 
of anything. It's not your house, it's not your children, it's not your money, it's not your investment, it is meeting with your maker. And when this happens, what happened? What's going to happen to you? Are you ready to meet your maker? That's the only thing that will really, really matters. All the rest is not going to, uh, uh, believe me, uh, I was there, okay? And also maybe you say, I'm still young, I'm not even 50 years old. I know that in Lighthouse now we have many that reached for the 50 bar and more. So be careful, all of you. Be ready to meet with your maker. I don't want to scare you. But after, after me in the hospital, the doctor told me there was a young man, 30 years old, and he just came after me for the same reason as I came there. So there's no age for that. And there is no uh, warning when it comes to you. So be ready to meet with your maker. So are you saved by the blood of Jesus? You know, in many churches, we all assume because we sit in the church building that we are saved. But are we saved by believing in the, uh, the Lord Jesus, by going to the cross, having given our life to Jesus, having welcomed and received the Savior. Is it sure? Have you drifted away from that original confidence that maybe some of you have had? Have you been captive, taken captive by other things in your life that you have been? Are you still in right standing with Jesus today? That's the most important things. Are you ready to meet your Savior and your judge today? That's point number one. And you see here in the scriptures, and just as people are appointed to die once and then to face judgment, how will we escape if we neglect a salvation as great as this? So that's my exhortation this morning. When the cardio ICU team were working on me, the, you saw the picture before, they go through here and the, and the vein and the vascular and they go to the heart. And then when they were working, I was awake. I was very conscious. I'm not like a dreamy under the, uh, the, the, the effect of drugs, not at all. The effect of drugs is, is local. It just uh, take off the pain. And then the pain here reduced, and I felt nothing of the intervention itself. But my brain was very clear-minded at that time. And after they gave me these anesthetic meds, the pain reduced, and I, think, I, I began to think about death and realize, oh, this is how people die. And that's what I'm talking to you this morning. That's the pain is real. And when you die, you, most people die in pain. That's, that's unfortunate, but it's like that. Car crash or uh, falling, uh, a, a disease, uh, you know, something. That, that, that's what caused that. that, that that's why people go to hospital. And that, that's, that's the unfortunate uh, reality of our mortal body, of our mortality. We are mortal. We die. You will die. I will die. <laughs> so that's the reality of that. So I started to realize this and thinking, oh, this is how people die with so much pain. This is how we go there. And then as I was facing the strong possibility of death, I felt a great peace. And then suddenly I realized as the pain diminished and I started to think about the, the, the process of that, of the, the going through the process of, of dying, I started to realize the salvation of Jesus Christ. And I had a great overwhelming confidence and assurance in my salvation. It was a very special uh, experience to feel saved, to feel really that I have been saved. You know, I, I don't know if you are like me sometimes, but have you ever wondered about how do I really, really know that I am saved? Like, how do I feel, how do I come to realize with full, uh, okay, of course, the scripture tells us that we can know for sure that we have been saved in Jesus Christ. That's why he died on us. Like we have a lot of scriptures. Yes, we believe these and we say yes to that. But how, 
how can I say that? How can I come to the realization of this reality and, and, and feeling and this total assurance? And I had that. While they were working on me, I had this total assurance that I was safe and I was ready to go with Jesus. And I, I, it was a very special realization and a, a, a super abundant uh, exercise of appreciation, like a really thankful and grateful uh, to the Lord, extremely thankful to the Lord. And I was praising the Lord, realizing that he saved me and that he called me and also the good life. Wow, what a good life he has given to me. He saved me when I was young. He called me to serve him. He sent me to Hong Kong and I met all of you beautiful people and I've been to many countries to serve God and, my, and I had the most beautiful life companion in my life and wonderful children and my life is wonderful. You know, I, I'm so grateful for the life and I, I was realizing it. It was all coming clear to me in that moment and I felt ready to die with contentment. I was content. I always told my wife, I'm going to die happy. I'm going to die content of, of, of a life. And it was the reality that was given to me in that moment. Also through my mind at that moment, I was quoting a lot of scriptures. And also that gave me another uh, uh, point to, to share with, with all of you this morning. The importance of the Bible, the importance of the promises of God, even through the process of death. Uh, the, the reality of the Word of God. The importance and the support and the, 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 the Bible talks about the comfort of the scriptures, the comfort of the promise of God. You need that in the process of going to meet your maker. You need these comforting words, these reassuring uh, reality. And then into my mind, I was so happy because that's, you know, I was learning something. I was learning about the process of, of dying. And in the process of dying as a Christian and as a follower of Jesus Christ, all these scriptures that I had read through all my years was coming to my mind. I was, of course, I was not quoting like uh, clearly. I was more like mumbling the, the scriptures because I was kind of uh, messed up and they were still working in my, uh, you know, I, I, I had these uh, instruments going through my my. My, my veins at the time and they were all I was surrounded by a group of people who were talking to each other but during this time of perfect peace I was quoting scriptures that was coming into my mind and then I thought about my children and then I prayed to the Lord that he would bring them wholeheartedly to follow him. I thought of my mom who has uh, been hospitalized recently and Brigitte's mom because they have been on our hearts a lot praying for them. And also I was also coming to the realization that my dear wife would be safe in the Lord's hands even though I was going to go with the Lord and all of these things. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure she was thinking in the same way on that day. but. Uh, but I felt that, that peace and that confidence that it would be okay. Amen. Amen. So that's part one, okay? Part two. Oh, part two. Jesus gave me a promise when I was there. Okay, and let me explain how it came. When I was here in the church that morning with the pastors, Pastor Jennifer was here, so uh, because we were the host church of all the pastors and their wives, I gave the word of welcome and I gave it a uh, devotion. And in that devotion, I shared to them something that I had been reading from the U version, the Bible apps that many of us uh, have on our phone. And uh, as a result, in 2018, the most highlighted, uh, shared, bookmarked verse on 350 million devices around the world was Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. So I was just sharing that verse to the pastors because that's, that's great that on all the verse in the Bible that most people around the world would have bookmarked chosen that this verse of the Bible as the most important to them that they would uh, give it to them. So I, I thought it was significant 
Because me, uh, to tell you the truth, I am not the kind of person that um, I've looked at the, you know, some, sometimes people have a, a, a promise book. You know, like uh, on the table, the kitchen table, that people every day will take a promise. Oh, Lord, this is the promise for me today. I don't like that. I, I don't want to be like this, to just uh, think of the Word of God like an horoscope. Oh, I will be blessed today. Poof. Oh, I will be rich today. Oh, I will be this. I will be that. I didn't want to approach the scriptures and, and uh, the way of a promise box. But in a way, I, I realized that and all the millions of people that have selected that verse, it must be significant for something. And then as I was talking to, to the pastors, then I was uh, making a link with the events that happens to our lives, that we are not in control. I was talking to the pastors, many of the pastors, one of them uh, had a heart attack uh, maybe three years ago, another one fell and broke his teeth, one had a, a, a cancer on his tongue, another one lost his wife, uh, Brother Vic and Taipo, another one has two the children born with genetic problems, always uh, on the verge of, of dying, things like that. And, and other positive uh, life-changing experience, it happens to anybody. So I was linking the importance of having that kind of word from the Lord, why people select and find comfort of that kind through a scriptures, and that scripture seemed to be very, very important. So as I was lying there, uh, with the hospital and the cardio team, and they were working on my, operating on me, this verse was given to me by the Lord himself. And that was, wow, a wow moment. Because, yeah, yeah, let me see that. Yes, that's the verse right here. Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will make you strong. Yay! I will help you. Yay! Can you say yay this morning? Yay. Yes. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. So, wow. Imagine what I was experimenting. The first part, part one, I was dying. And I was uh, leaning toward the process of death, thinking about it, and thinking about the strong possibility, this is what is awaiting me. And suddenly, the Lord speak, and then he tells me, hey, yay, I'm with you, my friend. You're not dying today. I have other plans for you. <laughs> I will make you strong. I am with you, and I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. Yay! That's what I say to the Lord. Uh, imagine how I could uh, feel I'm not going to die, and the Lord was reassuring me and calling me to trust Him. I am your God. I am your God. And I want to stress the yay and to that scriptures. Of course, that is from the King James, the yay. And uh, let's not be afraid to say yay sometime. Remember the song like, uh, uh, that we sing, that we change the yay for yes. We should put back the yay there because it says in the King James. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of saying yes, 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 we say yay, yay, yay. Okay, anyway, that's just a sideline. <laughs> yay are really words that are part of the original text. They are words, or conjunctions, uh, that will bring an addition, especially something greater. Furthermore, moreover, indeed, so much the more, okay? So to th think about it now, okay? Don't be afraid, I am, your, I am with you. Don't be afraid, for I am your God, don't be dismayed. I will make you strong. Furthermore, moreover, I will help you. Furthermore, I will uphold you. That is the wonderful promise of the Lord. Imagine, imagine, uh, I was facing death, and suddenly Jesus spoke to me. I will make you strong. Yeah, I will help you. Yeah, I will uphold you. What an experience. Moving toward the assurance that I would live. I'm not going to die. God was giving me the promise of his divine presence. He was telling me he was going to heal me. He was restoring me with strength and he was to uphold me. And I was going to come out of this experience stronger, help and uphold 
by the hand of Jesus himself. How do you think it made me feel? How do you think it made me feel? This was a real experience that I was. So I want to address you this morning. How can you receive the Lord's promise for the situation you're in, for your storm, for the year ahead? How can you yourself receive these kind of precious moment, the, the reality, Jesus come to your rescue, Jesus speak to you. Don't be afraid, I am with you. This is a simple verse, yet it is full of relief and care. It's like your friend is sitting beside your, your dead bed or your sick bed and he is telling, hey, I am with you. I am with you. I am here. I like your, your spouse is with you. I am with you. This is the, the, the kind of uh, closeness that says, when God tells us, fear not. And how many times does God tell in the Bible, fear not. In all sorts of situations, to all sorts of people, and always people that he is going to use, always to someone who, who is serving him from his people, and heading into trouble. And the Lord is speaking to them about something of the future. Be strong. Be bold. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I will fight for you. I am going everywhere you will go. I'll be with you. I'm going ahead of you. All of these words. I, I read. I don't know if it's true. I haven't, uh, I haven't checked that. But it says that there are 365. Don't quote me on that. It's not from me. 365. Do not fear. Promise in the Bible. One for each day. I don't think it's true, but anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying you, there, there's, there's a lot of these uh, fear not, do not be afraid, or very comforting uh, promises in the Bible. We fear not because God has told us that he will be with us. And God has established, think about it, God has established a very special relationship with you. I am your God. So it says, it's not only I am with you, but he is also identifying uh, in the name of who, who, who he is, and from what angle he's going to come to you. I am your God. And we need to uh, realize the reality of that relationship that we have from God. It's, it's strange that sometimes it takes a dramatic situation to bring you to fully realize these things. Because most of the times we get busy, we run here, we run there, we are distracted, and we know it in the mind, but the reality and the daily life is not really there. And then suddenly you come to a crash, you fall on your face, something dramatic happened to you, and then you start to uh, think differently about, about life. And I know that many of you at different times in your life had similar uh, dramatic uh, uh, way God sees your attention and woke you up to, uh, to be more careful about your life, about your health, and all of these things. Amen? Hallelujah. So are you aware of all the ways that God has helped you. Can you remember some promises that became very personal to you at specific moment? We need that. God says in this text here, be not dismayed. And the word dismayed is even reinforcing uh, or stressing, do not be afraid. That's already enough. But be not dismayed is even coming immediately after. And each one has a reason why. For I am with you, for I, 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 am, your, I am your God. And uh, this is very, very strong. Be not dismayed. It's like to look around uh, and panic, you know, and, and danger. Like you, you, you don't know where to look. You're, you're panicking. You're, you're stressed out. You're, you're out of your resources. And ah, that's what it means. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't go that far. But trust in the Lord. In our lives, we, are time, we have time when we just want God to show up and reassure us that He is here with us. And that's why God, so many times, I, I use the word whispers, because many times we read these words and they do not uh, take 
as much attention or captivate us as much. And God whispers repeatedly to many places in the scriptures, in the book of the Bible, that we are supposed to read, that we are supposed to enjoy, that we are supposed to delight in, that we are supposed to feed our faith upon, then that sometimes we just neglect and don't do. But God so often whispers words in the pages of the Bible, just words like this. Of many, many other scriptures like, like this one. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. I will be with you when you pass through the waters. They will not overwhelm you. I'm shortening the, the scriptures a little bit. You will not be scorched when you walk through the fire. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. Oh, wonderful scriptures. I will be the same until your old age. Hey, Sister Lisa, do you like that? <laughs> until your old age. Nanai, where are you? Until your old age, I will be the same until your old age. I'm not quoting myself because I'm still young. <laughs> I will be the same until your old age. I will bear you up. I have made you. I have made you. So I will carry you. I will bear you. And I will rescue you. Amen. Amen, Amen to that. Hallelujah. Knowing and trusting God's providence. That God is that kind of God with the wonderful promise. It's not always easy because when the crisis happen and when the stress uh, full situation happen, it's not easy. And sometimes we tend to that dismay, looking with you know panic and all of these things. But to go back to the realizations of the providence of God transform our life. It transform our response to the crisis. It tr transform our reactions and it transform our decisions that we will make in order to, to move forward. It gives us power to move with purpose in our life. You know, I keep telling people, I have a repaired heart. I have a new life. Hey, I'm going ahead. It's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. Amen. That was part two. Okay. Do you have your promise this morning? You know, we are going to enter in the time of prayer and fasting. This is the time. Don't miss this week. You know, it's not something that, don't just look and despise it and just minimize it into your heart. Oh, it's okay to do it every year. Da, 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 da. <laughs> don't, don't approach what the church is doing like this. this. This is a serious time. This is a time that can transform your spiritual life, awaken you, and give you a, a, a divine uh, uh, power, divine new outlook uh, of life. So, so go for it. Fast, pray, do something, but join us and join, join God. Join with God. Part three, we don't know what is in our heart. Do you know what is in your heart? Do you know? I was approached by someone this morning. Oh, pastor, you're still here. Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's okay, it's okay, I'm still here. You're a... <laughs> and the question that was asked me is, why? Why did you go that? I would like to know that answer. Believe me, I would like to know that why. We don't know what is in our heart. You and I, we don't know what's in our heart. You may think that you do. You may think it's not a big deal, okay? And you don't know that. Before December 12, I was certain that I was in a great help. I was certain that I was in a great help. Do you know what is in your heart? Before December 12, if you would ask me, I go to the gym. My diet is very good. I talk with the dietitians after the heart attack. What uh, do you eat for breakfast? I told her, I said, oh, that's very good. What do you eat for lunch? Oh, that's, oh, that's very good. What do you eat for dinner? Oh, that's very good too. So what is the problem? That's not the diet. So sometimes we think it's the diet, it's not the diet. Oh, cholesterol? No, you're just borderline. You're not in danger. Blood pressure? It's good. 
What's the problem? Where does it come from? I don't know where it comes from. Doctors don't know also where, where these things uh, come from. Is it, uh, is it like uh, heredity? Maybe it is. So me, I was certain that I was in the great health because I eat well. I walk every night. I, I complete my, my 10,000 steps every day, <laughs> you know? And uh, I do everything okay, you know? I go to the gym a few times a week and you know, I, I feel good. So if you would ask me, uh, will you have a heart attack on December 12th? <laughs> Never, I'm going never to have a heart attack. I'm in, top, I'm in top shape, you know. But then I got a shocking surprise on that day when they told me, Mr. Lucier, you are having an acute heart attack. Where does that come from? <laughs> Three main arteries were blocked. What caused it? They don't know and I don't know. But this, this is a picture that I, I don't tell anybody, but I stole it from my file with my mobile phone one day when they were not looking and then I took it this way. <laughs> because I asked, I asked to have that photo and they says, no, you cannot have it, but I have it. Okay, don't tell anybody. Okay? <laughs> if, <laughs> okay, if you look here, maybe you will not see because you're too far. There's nothing there, okay? And if you look, hear about, you can see there is. That's before and that's after. You can see the flow of blood and here there's nothing over there. Who knows what's in their heart? When they told me you have three veins, one is enough, but I have two more. And then one day I met with the doctor, I says, Okay, are you sure about the two others? Do I really need it? Can I postpone it until later? Uh, do I really need it? And then he went back, checked, came back to me and says, they are 90% blocked. This one was completely blocked. That's why I had a heart attack. But the other ones were uh, almost blocked. So he says, if you don't do it, you will be back again for the same reason. I said, okay, 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 okay. I don't want to. <laughs> Okay, so what caused a heart problem? If you look at this picture here, you see a, a bit of what happened into your arteries. I'm not a doctor, so I, I just look and uh, got some information. So you see some uh, blockage over here, some uh, plaques that will come and, you know, from the cholesterol and then, and then it will block and everything. Anyway, there's more to see on that, but just to tell, you don't know it, you don't see it, you don't feel it, and then suddenly you are in the ambulance and you are on the operating table and you don't know what happened. Why? Because you don't know what's in your heart. And some of you in this room here, be careful. I told someone this morning I don't want to go and visit you in the hospital. So, you know, and I thank all of you who came to visit me, by the way. I, it was uh, overwhelming with all the, the expressions of, of love and friendship. Thank you so much. But, you know, w why do we have that? Okay, different uh, reasons. Let's talk about physical and spiritual because we can make a link. Physical, it may be diet or negligence, maybe some little bit bad habits, eating things that we don't, we should not be eating. Like me, I like chips, okay? I confess, I confess. Um, it can be these kind of things. Um, so if you go to the spiritual, little negligence are also part of our spiritual life. As in the physical, you don't know what is in your heart, but little negligence, little spiritual negligence, may lead you to a heart that is not uh, good spiritually, like the, the, the heart. Amen. Bad habits, spiritual negligence that leads to drifting from the path, being careless about your spiritual life, the heart disease kill. And spiritual heart disease kill also. Then it could be heredity. Um, we inherit.
spiritually a sinful nature from our parents, a corrupt nature, a sin-infected disease at the core of our being. All of us in this room, we, I will repeat it, inherited of a sinful, corrupted nature at the core of our being. Can we honestly and humbly admit that this morning? That's very important. You know, we in this room all have a sin problem. And because of that, there are areas of darkness. We let develop and we didn't get rid of certain things in our hearts and it has caused areas of darkness. Even Christian can walk in darkness. Let's look at these scriptures. God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. If we see we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus' His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living the truth. This is a very revealing text, if you think about that, in line of what we talk about not knowing what is in our heart. God is light, there is no darkness in Him. If we so look at verse 6 for a moment. If we say we have fellowship while we walk in darkness. This text is addressed to Christian from the Apostle Paul, uh, John. This is a letter written to Christian. It says, we say we walk in the light while we walk in darkness. So this is a possibility that happens to us. And says, we lie and do not practice the truth. And verse 8 says, we are only fooling ourselves. And we are not fooling. So that's, there's a danger over here. First of all, God is light. Not a light. He is light and his core nature. The effect of light is to make something visible. Something that we don't see. When I was being operated... They had a bunch of cameras and very high definition uh, x-rays, like special ones. Not, not the one that you, you, you do, but special ones. And then they put a dye into your heart, and then they follow uh, everything that is happening where they are. And then they see things through these special lights that you don't know that exist. You cannot see that. And it's the same spiritually that we have. The effect of light is making something visible, something that you couldn't see. John gives a positive and a negative. God is life, and in him there is no darkness at all. Talking about God. This is an absolute, there is no darkness there with God. You know, there are positive and negative for us to walk in the light. Walking in the light as a socializing effects. We have fellowship with one another. You walk in the light, I walk in the light, we have good fellowship with one another. Walking in the light is also a sanctifying effect. You walk in the light, the blood of Jesus keep sanctifying us, purifying us, and all this. It's wonderful. You walk in the light, you're okay. It's like your disease is not there. You will, you will not have... Uh, these blocked arteries, uh, spiritually speaking, because you walk in the light, there will not be any poison, no plaques, no cholesterol that will come and, uh, and, uh, and damage you. But the opposite of light is darkness. And darkness is things that we don't see and that we don't know about. And John calls it absence of truth in sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Walking in darkness results in lying to others, lying to ourselves, deceiving ourselves, and worst of all, we are lying about God, which is worse, because we're saying things that is not true. Christians can walk in darkness, yet convince themselves that everything is okay. You think your heart is fine? then you end up having a heart attack. We can be deceived as well, ignoring the real condition of your heart. And this is a very dangerous path to walk on. Lying about God 
Because, you know, when we don't walk in the light and there are areas of darkness, you know what the danger is. You will be trying to justify your sinfulness and minimize the, the effect of sin or the reality of sin and darkness. So in order to do that, you must uh, imagine God differently, a God that tolerates a God that is cool with your sin. A God that doesn't look at the seriousness of your sin. And then you start to imagine that. And then you may even twist scriptures and come to uh, twist God into what suits your darkness. Do you understand what I'm talking about? This is the real danger of not knowing the darkness that is in our hearts. Because it will affect our our idea of God. We, we don't talk so much about holiness when, or righteousness when we have darkness. We talk about grace and cool and, and easygoing and uh, accepting and, and all this. And then you minimize and you change the nature and the character of God in your own imagination. And then you have another God than the God of the Bible as your God. And it is a very destructive pathway to be on. And I would say that this is the very big, one of the most serious tragedy affecting the Christian world today. Look on YouTube, what you hear about God, the teaching, uh, opinions, books, debates, that you, you read horrible things uh, about the nature of God, about the depicting God and, and grace and everything. I think this is one of the most serious tragedy affecting the Christian world today. When we walk in the light, people can see it. We, someone says, you are not a sinner because you do sinful things. You do sinful things because you are a sinner. And you were born a sinner, and that's why you need a savior. Amen? And closing, as we enter in a special week of fasting and praying, talking about the heart. In this text here, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So it is a prayer. We have a privilege to have a glimpse into the prayer life of the Apostle Paul. I keep asking God that he will give you a spirit of revelation that you may know him better. And I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Many of the modern versions will use the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your mind. But actually the true word is the eyes of your understanding. And the word that is used is the faculty of the mind to understand things, the things of God that is not, not only a, a general knowledge, but a true knowledge that is only... Uh, enlightened, illuminated by the effect of the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives. So, in our days, many Christians, you and I included, we are easily satisfied with what we call inferior knowledge. What we read on Facebook, what we read in the Google News, what we read in, in the magazines, economy, uh, you know, the, the Times and all of these things and, and all the, the world view that is shared about us and everything and the, and the investments and the money market and all of these things that we, we have around us. We become so um, interested and we come so easily satisfied with the inferior knowledge, the worldly, the passing. And at the moment of death, it's useless. It's useless. There is an urgent, extraordinary need for the church today to pray that God would grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know Him so that or the eyes, you know, the eyes of our understanding that cannot see the heart, that doesn't know what is in the heart, that is not aware of the darkness in the heart. We pray that the Holy Spirit will illuminate, enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that we will get it, that we will understand what's wrong in our hearts. 
as we begin prayer and fasting, that's the, the point, the summary of this morning. When you die, death is too sudden or the pain is too intense. Don't delay, don't put it off. Be ready to meet your maker now. Deal with your sin. Deal with the hindrances. Deal with the distractions. Deal with the temptations. Deal with the lifestyle. Be sure of your salvation. Be sure that if you die today, you are ready to meet your maker. This is number one as you enter this week of prayer today. If you don't do anything else this week, do this. Because this is the ministry of the Word of God. This is the ministry of the Great Commission. This is the ministry of the church. This is the ministry that we need to bring a reconciliation to all men. Number two, how can you receive the Lord's promise for the situation you're in, for the trouble you face, for the pressure, the stress, the dismayed look that you have sometimes, and for the year ahead? God has a promise for you. God has, has a relationship with you. I am with you. I am your God. And yea, I will help you. So where is your promise? Are you thirsty for that kind of promise? Fast and pray. This is why we have this week. Number three, you don't know what's in your heart. Let the light, God the light, make visible what you cannot see. Dig in the word. Get in the secret room. Let God whisper to you this week. And pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Amen.